Thank you. Hands on with DevNet Create. That was awesome, right? Good job, guys. All right. Okay, so for our next talk, uh, we have Drew Zachary and Radhika Bhatt. Please come on up. You can set up your computers as you come. Uh, we're super excited about uh, partnering with the Department of Commerce uh, on this new project. And let me just tell you a little bit about Drew and Radhika. So Drew is a senior analyst with the US Department of Commerce Data Services. And she was the leader and co-founder of the Opportunity Project, which we're going to hear about here. She was a 2014 Presidential Management Fellow at HUD and HHS. Uh, Drew holds a Master's in Public Policy from Johns Hopkins and is a PhD candidate in Social Policy at Brandeis. Her favorite color is black. <laughs> she likes tattoos. <laughs> she likes tattoos. Okay, no demo of that. And her spirit, <laughs> and her spirit animal is a lady lion. <laughs> uh, Radhika. So Radhika is a user experience designer and front-end developer with the U.S. Department of Commerce Data Service. She's a recipient of the 2016 DC Femtech Powerful Female Designer Award. Uh, Radhika is left-handed. Enjoys left-handed. Anyone left-handed? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> enjoys marbling paper and likes watching science fiction movies with popcorn. Yes. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> uh, and one thing that I'm really proud of is as we were creating this partnership, they somehow managed to write a wonderful blog about the opportunity and get approval from the government to publish the blog. <laughs> Amazing, right? <Yeah. laughs> <Take some time. laughs> Thank you guys. Go ahead. I'm um, 30 you. minutes on the clock, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're really excited to talk to you guys today about the Opportunity Project, um, which is one of the ways that we at the Department of Commerce and in general in federal government are trying to work with developers like you to create economic opportunities for people across the country, leveraging the power of open data and technology. Um, so once again, I am Drew. Um, I don't really know what a senior analyst means, although that is my title. <laughs> um, I'm a social scientist and I do design research. My name is Radhika Bhatt. I'm a user experience designer and also a Meerkat impersonator, so we can talk about that later. Ask her to do it <laughs> in Q&A. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to talk about the Opportunity Project and open data, but before we dive into that, I want to start off with an idea for you guys, which is that government data can help real people to solve real problems, and we just need to get the right people to the table. So to put that into context, I want to tell you guys about Brianna. So Brianna, who you see on the screen here, is a really incredible person. Um, she has an amazing story and a lot of challenges that she's overcome. Um, and I want to tell you about the ways that open data could really have helped her life and why she came to speak at the White House. So the picture that you're seeing of her here is in March 2016 when we first launched the Opportunity Project. Brianna came to speak about her experiences. So Brianna lives in Baltimore. Uh, she has an adorable young son, and when he was a newborn, she was at one point commuting four hours a day, which we're in California, so some people might not blink at that, but <laughs> for East Coast people, that's a long time, um, within the city of Baltimore to get her young child to daycare, to get to a job training program, to get to work, to get to the school that she was trying to get her degree so that she could have more opportunities for her and her family. So. Uh, there was a lot of information for Brianna that could have really changed her experience. If she had known um, about transit routes, if she had accessible data on transportation options, on the locations of daycare facilities, uh, job training centers, job opportunities near her, if she had that information at her fingertips through technology, she could have had a really different experience. And when Brianna came to speak at the White House, that was one of the things that she talked about because we had worked with developers from different companies to create tools that actually put that information at her fingertips. And not only is Brianna an amazing person on her own, she's also a community organizer. Because it's 2017 and we can put all of this information at her fingertips, it not only helps her, but it helps people in the communities that she works with. So when Brianna came to speak at the White House, she talked about this tool that I'll tell you guys about now. So this, is a, this heat map is part of a tool called Opportunity Score. Opportunity Score was created by Redfin, which is a company that you guys may have heard of. They have a lot of housing data on rental and homes for purchase. Maybe you've sold your house through Redfin. Um, and so obviously they have a lot of data on housing and affordable housing even. They also have Walk Score. 
And our department, the Department of Commerce, the Census Bureau, has really incredible information on the locations of all, almost all jobs and job characteristics across the country. So the developers at Redfin put all of that information together and they created opportunity score, which is what you're looking at. So what this is, is basically a score from zero to 100 that tells you how accessible that home location is from jobs within 30 minutes without a car. So a 30 minute car free commute, either walking or through transit. So you can type in any address, look at any housing listing um, and find out on a scale of zero to 100, how many jobs, how, how accessible is it? And really how many jobs and which jobs are available to you within 30 minutes without a car. So imagine how transformative that would have been for someone like Brianna, who was trying to solve those problems for her family. So the next tool that I wanna talk about I'm gonna ask you guys to think about a totally different part of the country. So maybe some people here are from a small town or have been to small towns in rural areas, but I want you to imagine that you're uh, living in a small town in southwestern, rural southwestern Virginia. So um, one of the problems that you might be experiencing is that there's not a lot of people in the town and you need to do something like buy a new fire truck to keep everybody safe. And because you don't have that many people, you don't have a lot of time and expertise on how to do that or how to get a grant, you're probably having a bake sale after church every Sunday to purchase a new fire truck. And you can imagine that that's probably gonna take a while to sell enough brownies. So um, the, the thing that you might not know, and probably don't know, is that there's a whole office of rural development at the US Department of Agriculture, which has um, basically loans and loan guarantees specifically for that problem, specifically to help small rural towns with the infrastructure that they need. So you could be getting this loan overnight, uh, pay it back over 50 years, and have so much more time available to really tell the story of your town, do things that are really important. And more importantly, you might not be able to, you might not really have the, the um, technology available to you to, to, to tell that story, to tell people what are the unique resources that I have in my community that would help me transition my economy, you know, since manufacturing has left, um, to bring people into the, to the community and really want to live there and visit. So what this tool, Find Your Town, did, you can go to findyour.town now and check it out, um, is it basically solves exactly those problems. And they did that through with developers using open data. So they took USDA's data on all of those loans and loan guarantees and grant resources that are available to communities. They combined it with functionality to create a custom website and storyboard that requires no greater technical skill than using PowerPoint. And they've created this resource, Find Your Town, that anyone can use to tell the story of the natural resources, the small businesses, the character, the unique history that their town has to help attract residents, businesses, new investments, and really help to um, grow their economy and make it thrive again. And all of this, again, was built with government data and through developers like you. So the last example that I want to give you is um, about uh, this tool that's called Job Seeker that was built by a company called Perrin. And so something else that you guys might have some experience with, maybe this is you or someone in your family or someone you know who might be in a military family. So one of the challenges that you might know about is that especially for military spouses, when families have to move around a lot, it can be really hard for a military spouse to maintain a career trajectory because you're having to move so much and have so many disruptions to your career. So even if you have really incredible skills like leadership, resilience, creative problem solving, things that are super valuable to employers, it might be hard to kind of translate that into a resume or a cover letter or even to find the right job opportunities where people would value those skills. So Perrin used Again, open data, as you might have guessed, to create a solution to that problem. So Perrin took a really awesome new open API called the Open Skills API that the Department of Labor created in partnership with the University of Chicago and also used data from companies like Glassdoor that you might know about to pull together a ton of information on jobs, apprenticeship opportunities, training programs. So Perrin took all of that information, they combined it with their unique technology that helps to translate, um, basically take a survey, you guys can all go online and do this, um, tries to extract information about the unique skill set that you have, generates 
um, not only sort of a custom template for a resume and cover letter that communicates your soft skills, but also then uses government data to actually point out job and apprenticeship and training opportunities that are in your local community and helping military families, whether spouses or veterans coming off of active duty, maybe you are a an art artillery specialist in the military, how do you translate that into a civilian job? Job Seeker is something that helps you to do that. So what do all of these tools have in common? And the answer, in addition to the fact that they're great, is that they were created through the Opportunity Project. And all of these tools um, there are available at opportunity.census.gov. So if you have a phone or a laptop in your hand and want to check it out, we encourage you to follow along or go there after this talk. Um, but there have been over 40 of these tools created to date through the Opportunity Project. Um, and they've been created from companies that you know about, probably like LinkedIn, Airbnb, Fitbit, Mapbox, but also startups, um, small businesses, universities, even civic tech organizations that some of you might be involved in. So we've worked with a lot of people, and at the core of that process is developers. So I'm going to tell you guys a little bit more about how that actually works. So before I do that, I want to return to the original idea that we started with, which is that we can solve real problems like the ones I just described with government data, and we just have to get the right people in a room together, or virtually together. So um, the Opportunity Project is one of the processes that we have created in government to do exactly that. So I'll talk a little bit more about how this actually works, but what it means at the core is that we bring together developers, technologists, policy leaders, communities, people on the ground who really understand the economic challenges that people are facing, and we create a process for them to work together to create these solutions. And that is the Opportunity Project. So I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit more about how this actually works in practice. So we created the Opportunity Project um, back, first had the idea back in December 2015, but it officially launched in March 2016, and we have since really identified three goals of this work. So the first one, like I just mentioned, is to facilitate collaboration between technologists, government, and people in communities across the country. Um, we want to create the lightest weight, easiest process. Um, like Susie mentioned, it may be something that we all think about with government, that it can be slow and not so responsive and difficult to work with. So through the Opportunity Project, we want to create an experience, especially for developers and technologists, but for everyone, that is easy, lightweight, makes sense, easy for you to come to us or for us to reach out to you and work together to solve a problem that we're all interested in. So the second thing, um, which I want to talk a little bit more about, is our goals around data. So obviously, a really core element of this process is the data that we want people to work with. Um, so has anyone ever been to data.gov? Show of hands. Awesome. Cool. Okay, like maybe 40%. That's great. So hopefully it was a magical experience for you. <laughs> Um, but you may have noticed that there is, uh, since 2009 when data.gov was launched, there have been almost 200,000 data sets added to data.gov, which is wonderful, and we really believe that transparency and access to information that belong, belongs to all of us as public data is really critical, and that's a really important first step. But we also want to go a step further and say it shouldn't just be on a website. It should actually be accessible and easy to use um, and developer friendly, and it should actually be translated into solutions for people. Um, so the Opportunity Project is sort of one of the things that we've built on top of that layer of open data to, to help people actually dive into it who have the technical skills to transform it into something useful. So that's another principle that we really believe in, and it sounds like everyone here does as well, is that data is only as valuable as the tools that we have to consume it. Um, so that's something that developers really bring to the table and why developers are so critical to this process is because we need you to help us translate this information into solutions. Um, and then obviously the third part of this is that this isn't just about data and building something for fun. This is about actually generating outcomes for people who, um, you know, who could stand to benefit economically from these tools. So although 40 tools have been created to date, we don't want to just stop at that number. We want to look several years down the line and say how many people were able to keep their family afloat because of a tool that they used. 
how many rural communities were able to generate new investments after really struggling economically because they had access to this technology. And that's why we need your help. So I'll tell you a little bit more about how this process actually works. So the, um, the Opportunity Project works through something that we're all probably familiar with, a technology development sprint of about 10 to 12 weeks. So we bring together all of these pieces of the ecosystem, the technologists, the community members, the policy leaders, um, and we start with a problem. So if you go to opportunity.census.gov, what you'll see on our build page is some user scenarios, which are just really detailed descriptions of the problems that people are facing. So we believe really strongly in human-centered design, which Radhika is going to talk a little bit more about, and starting from a realistic problem that actually is in need of a solution. So for instance, if you click on any of these user scenarios, you'll see a really first-hand description of a problem, for example, from a community leader in New Orleans who really needs access to information so that she can be a better advocate for people in her neighborhood to get housing assistance or to um, get compensation for damage to their homes, or someone um, who is a young person who's experiencing homelessness, who really needs access to information on Wi-Fi hotspots or a safe shelter so that she can uh, prepare for a really important job interview the next day. Um, so if you check these out, you'll see some of the problems that we've tackled so far. The next piece is obviously the data. And so, like I said, some of you, you know, have been to data.gov, and if you go to data.gov slash opportunity, you'll see a collection of data sets that we think are really relevant to these problems. But one of the things that we've tried to do is make it really easy for people to find, especially for developers, technologists who are building through this process, to find the information that they need. So if you went to data.gov and were trying to find something like Wi-Fi hotspots, it might not be the easiest thing to find or in general to know what data on, you know, what open government data is even available to solve these problems. Is it at the federal level? Is it at the state level or the city level? Does my city have that data? So we try to create an experience that helps developers to find that information really easily so that you can start actually working with the data. And the other thing that we do is take your feedback on how to improve our data quality because we are working with the Census Bureau and other agencies that are responsible for stewarding this data. We uh, want your feedback so that we can improve it and have a better experience and be able to create better products in the back end. So like I said, this works through a development sprint. We bring together all of these pieces of the, um, of the, different, of the puzzle. Um, developers, people with lived experience, data experts collaborate over 10 to 12 weeks and build, uh, whether it's an app, a website, incorporate data into a platform, a digital marketing strategy, anything that uses data to solve one of these problems um, in a human-centered way. And then we help to connect them with people who actually need them. So one of the things that I wanted to emphasize is that we, all we do in this process is facilitate. We bring people to the table, and then we let you guys actually drive the solutions. Um, we really believe that people who have tech expertise, who know how to build things, technologists who exist in the world to create and think of technology solutions to problems should be the ones who are driving the solutions. And so that's why they're such a critical component of the process and why we try not to get in the way too much. So like I said, probably a dozen times so far. <laughs> Um, you can check out all of this information at opportunity.census.gov. You can also see some of the problems that we've solved so far, everything from promoting emotional well-being in communities to helping military families to helping um, homeless veterans um, and homeless young people um, find the resources that they need to thrive and succeed economically. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Radhika, who is going to talk a little bit more about what we're doing next and how we think that you guys should get involved. Yeah, so um, thank you. Drew has done an amazing job of just talking about what we've done so far, and now I want to tell you a little bit more about what's coming up and how you all can get involved. So um, we just launched two new cohorts. Um, one of them is focused on the problem of homelessness. So we have partnered with um, a couple different government agencies and, is, and nonprofits as well that um, have familiarity with this, with homelessness. So specifically, we have one team focusing on uh, youth homelessness. So for example, we've partnered with Fair Fairfax County Public Schools, which is a county uh, close to DC, and we're working with them to understand what um, 
people that are young and homeless, what they're experiencing on how they're, if they're still going to school and, and what their experience is like. Then we're also working with the Department of Veterans Affairs and um, veterans uh, medical facilities to understand what homeless veterans are experiencing, what they need, and how we can help them using technology. Um, and also coming up in the future, um, if you came to our workshop yesterday, you might have heard a little bit about what we're doing with the 2020 census. Um, and so another sprint that we have coming up is going to focus on how to engage hard to count populations for the 2020 census. And we're super excited to be working on that. And we can definitely talk more uh, with you about that as well. And then, um, you know, as we've talked about a lot of these uh, things that we focus on, specifically hope, the goal is to increase economic opportunity for all Americans. So in the future, we also hope to launch a sprint on streamlining access to federal funding for local communities like the one that Drew mentioned. Um, and so, like we've, we've talked about it a lot, that human-centered design is at the, the core of our process and we care a lot about the end user and making these tools sustainable. But I also just want to tell you a little bit about this role that we introduced uh, recently called the user advocate role. So I've talked about um, the, the local nonprofits and the grassroots organizations that are our partners, but they serve a really important role uh, as the user advocate. So um, we've found that we really want people to use these tools. We want them to be sustainable, and we want to create impact using data. And so the user advocate role really allows us to do that. They give us the insight about what's going on at the community level and what people need. So for example, I actually had a call yesterday uh, with the, uh, the team that's working on veterans homelessness, and I was speaking with a nurse practitioner that works at a uh, veterans medical facility. And a team, uh, that team is building a tool that kind of connects uh, the people at the veterans uh, medical facility, like doctors and the care providers, with the actual patient that's coming in. And um, they are building a tool that is going to be on um, accessible on mobile, so iOS and, an and Android, and also via computer. And so my question was, do these veterans, do homeless veterans actually have access to that technology, or is that an assumption that we're making? And this nurse practi practitioner that I spoke with informed me and the whole team that, yes, they do have access to technology. They regularly use phones. So that's why this tool that's being built for mobile and desktop is going to be used and is going to create impact. So that's an insight that we would really only be able to get from someone that that interfaces with veterans and that understands what they're going through. So that's really how we we focus on human-centered design and we're able to create that and create sustainable solutions. Um, and another thing that I think we've learned over this past year is that it's, it's kind of been a humbling experience for us as federal employees because oftentimes we work with um, program managers that oversee national programs and understand national data, but we don't really get to see the community level data. We don't get to see what's going on at the community. So that's really why the user advocate role, again, is super important in understanding and making these tools sustainable. So I've also talked a lot about sustainability. Um, so I just briefly want to mention something that we learned over this past year is that, um, so the, the hackathon model, I'll talk a little bit about that. So how many people have been to a hackathon? Cool. And how many people today, or like right now, know that the tools that they built are still being used? <laughs> Amazing. One person. That's great. <laughs> um, so as you can see, you know, we just saw that hackathons are awesome. They get everyone together. You, you get to hack away. You get to build things. But the problem is that oftentimes after the day or the weekend when you get together, the tools don't last very long or they're not used. So we kind of learned that, you know, that's not what we want. As the Opportunity Project, we want to create sustainable solutions that, that carry on, that continue, and that really help people, help people with, with anything that they need. So we kind of say no to the hackathon model. Um, and that's why we really want to drive sustainable solutions. And um, the user advocate role in, in getting all these people at the table is super helpful with that. Um, so that being said, I want to talk to you about different ways in which all of you can get involved in the Opportunity Project. So we've talked about the sprint process, but there's also many other ways that you can get involved with us um, outside of just the sprint. So um, is anyone involved in local civic tech communities from where they're from? So that includes like Women Who Code or um, Hack for Good and 
Yeah, Code for America, that's a big one as well. Yeah, cool. So that's great to see that a lot of people are involved. I'm super involved in Women Who Code DC, so that's, that's great. Um, but so this, is, this tool is one example. Um, Iron Yard in DC, or um, in New York City, they worked with their students. They brought in the Opportunity Project model to their classroom. And they worked with students uh, to use our curated federal data sets uh, to create tools, uh, for, for example, in New York City. So the students in the class were able to take Opportunity Project problem statements and data and apply it to a problem that they uh, understood or had experience with. So this one app is called Feed New York City, and it's actually available in, in the App Store for download. And it maps uh, food aid facilities in New York City. So if anyone needs a soup kitchen or a food aid pantry, um, then you can look at this information on a mobile app. You can find information about where you are and where the closest facility is and go to it and, and receive those, um, those resources if you need them. So that's one way, you know, you can take the Opportunity Project model. We, we have a playbook that we can share with you that you can take and you can bring it to your local civic tech community and work on problems in your community or work on problems that you're interested in. And also in the same way, um, I want to talk to you about this tool that was created last year called Streetwise. So a big thing that we also care about is working with you to, un to get feedback about our data and um, your experience working with government data. So this tool called Streetwise is super awesome. We love talking about it. Um, so this is a tool that was created to ground truth data. So for example, this is uh, mapping, mapped grocery stores in Oakland, so not too far from here, um, using Department of Housing and Urban Development data. So all the purple dots that you see are county reported grocery stores. So this is pulling from HUD data, federal data. And this tool, it's a mobile app, and it allows people living in the community to actually correct the data. So according to federal data, all these purple dots are grocery stores. So to me, that would say, that means that people have access to healthy food and that there's lots of grocery stores and maybe this is a healthy community. But after the ground truthing, you can actually see that a lot of these places are not in fact grocery stores. They're maybe convenience stores or liquor stores for that matter. So yeah, so this actually is <laughs> super important because it tells, it tells us, tells the community that these in fact, the community may not have access to healthy food, which is super important for people's well-being. So in this way, Streetwise is really helpful in correcting government data, giving us feedback, and telling us actually what the real situation is on the ground at, at the community level. Um, so all this being said, you know, we've talked so much about how developers are at the core of this process and so important, and we're really here to, t to tell you that we need you and that we want you to work with us. So um, we've talked a lot about how developers are so critical, and you're so important because you transform data into actual tools. You're responsible for creating sustainable tools and for really creating impact um, in your community or in a community around, around the U.S. Uh, so we currently have a mini hack going on in the next room that uses specifically census data. So uh, you can use census APIs or city SDK to map the U.S. population or just do different things with census data. And we, the biggest part with that is that we really want your feedback on that, that information or, and your experience using census APIs. Um, and then afterwards, you know, this doesn't have to end here. We'll be here for a couple hours. Come talk to us. Come tell us what you're interested in working on. We'd love to hear it. Um, and also, you know, you can follow along on opportunity.census.gov. We'll be put, putting new information on there. And also feel free to email us at opportunityproject.doc.gov. And we would just love to, to connect with you and to keep this going as well. So one of the things that um, I, I just wanted to remind everyone or challenge everyone uh, before we close out is, um, of course, we really want to work with you, um, but we also want to challenge you to build for people who are not currently being served by technology. Um, so one of our, another one of our principles is that as people who have technical skills and are, have the privilege of working with data and technology, we also have a lot of responsibility to share those resources and those skills to benefit everyone across the country. Um, and one of the things that a lot of the leaders from our team have said over and over that we really believe is that technology shouldn't be considered revolutionary until it helps every person. 
Um, so we challenge you to build for people who would never think of technology as part of the answer for them. So whether that's someone in a, a tribal nation who has hardly any data on their community at all, um, or someone from a rural community who's never even thought of technology as part of any solution, or a homeless veteran who is really not thinking about that at all, how can we bring technology to those people and make that part of the solution for them? Um, that's what we want to challenge you to do, and we really hope that you join us, and we can't wait to see what you build. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. thanks. I think I'm Great. Uh, we can put 10 minutes on the clock, or 12 minutes, because they saved a little bit of time. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. That was amazing. What did you guys think? Yeah. Woo. Amazing. <laughs> so uh, I think that uh, yesterday in the keynote, we talked about where applications meet infrastructure and how the definition of infrastructure is changing. I think infrastructure includes society. And we talked about you know, the opportunity that we all have in improving how applications meet society. And uh, so this was an awesome talk. <laughs> uh, it's amazing the transformation that you guys have done uh, within the government. Uh, tell me a little bit. Now, you're both very much pushing about user experience design and development and the opportunity for developers. You know, just tell us more about the importance of that. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I, I was just thinking about as well is human-centered design. You know, when you're building tools and when you're building things, at the end of it, you know, there's probably going to be a person interfacing with it, a person using it. So um, that's really where we pull in this whole idea of build with your user instead of for them. And that, I think, is just, you know, at the core of what we're doing and what we, what we think about. Um, and that also, to me, like, as a user experience designer, I'm always thinking about if I'm going to create something, who's going to be using it? What do they need? Why do they need this? Um, and all that, I think, applies to even the tools that all of you guys are building. Um, if a person's going to be using it, then I think the idea should be, it should be easy to use. It should be understandable. It should be accessible. All those things come into play. Mm -hmm. Excellent. The other thing that I would say is with the Opportunity Project, um, we try to think about that question at two levels. The first is obviously with the tools that are being built. But the second is really with the developers you know, experiencing interaction with government. We want to make that, we want to optimize the experience for you, you know, as human beings who are interacting with government, trying to use government data, APIs, or even if it's just trying to call someone on the phone and get the information that you need. Um, we really want to optimize that user experience because, you know, like so many examples um, from earlier this morning about if there's two people who are trying to solve the same problem, even if they're from different companies or in our case from different sectors, we want to make it as easy as possible to collaborate so that we can get to the solution faster for the members of the public who need it. That's awesome. Uh, and I love the point that you made about building solutions, encouraging the community to build solutions for those who are not currently served by tech. Mm -hmm. So, um, how did you come up with that? Where did where did that is that just core to what everybody's thinking? Are you guys driving that vision with opportunity? Um, yeah, I don't know if we can take credit for that entirely, <laughs> um, but the history of the Opportunity Project was really, um, you know, it started from an economic mobility team who, um, you know, were really focused on ending homelessness and helping people um, to connect with jobs and the resources that they need. And it, it didn't really start from technology. It started from, um, you know, equality of economic opportunity and creating job opportunities and growth opportunities for everyone. Um, and then we kind of merged with, um, with the tech people and the open data mission and started to ask that question of, can we really solve these problems with data and technology? And so this was all sort of an experiment to ask that question. and. It took off, and the developer community um, really jumped on board. And we saw that there were, you know, solutions being generated that were really working for people, or were at least the right proof of concept. So we kept going. Um, and I think, you know, the tool that I talked about, Find Your Town, um, we kind of had that aha moment of, okay, so we started this project, and it's all about cities, and we didn't mean for it to be, but it's something that, you know, kind of happens. Um, in, in the tech world in general. So we really um, 
worked to bring the right people into the mix from rural America um, to ensure that we were creating something that solved their problems as well. And we got an awesome solution in Find Your Town. So we continue to push ourselves to think about what are the, the problems that um, you know, aren't obvious that we can help to solve through this model. Excellent. Um, and uh, by the way, we're going to open up for a couple of questions from the audience in a little bit. Uh, so a big thing that's coming up is the census. So the census is measured once every, taken once every 10 years. Um, and I think that there's an important mission and problem that, that you guys want us to work on there as well. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, can, I guess I can give like a little background to the census. So um, we've seen that over the, the past, I guess the last census that was done, it was estimated that about 18% of the US population went uncounted. And so that's actually like, that's a huge amount of people. And the, the whole point of the census, it's um, constitutionally mandated that every individual in the United States gets counted. And that information is super important because it helps apportion federal funds for uh, local, com for just communities around the US. And it also uh, helps understand or like give the right number for um, House of Representative seats and also um, electoral votes, electoral college votes. So from just from that, you know, it's super important that we cor correctly count the population. But we've found that with this 18% that goes uncounted, it's, it's difficult to make sure that everyone is counted. So we want to make sure for this upcoming 2020 census that we count all those people. We count everyone. Um, and so that's really our, our focus. Do you want to talk a little bit more? Yeah, I think um, the only thing I would add is that, you know, we do, the sen our, our team at the census really does understand, you know, some of the things that drive um, non-participation or just make, make it hard to find people. And that can be everything from distrust in federal government to not, you know, understanding what the census does or knowing whether, you know, it's legit when they show up at your door. Um, to you know, not speaking English or not knowing how to participate or something that we talked about in the workshop yesterday was um, people being really mobile and just you know, people who want to participate, but it's really hard to reach them. Um, so we, the, the census is doing a really incredible job of thinking really creatively um, about how we modernize the census so that everyone is able to participate. Awesome. Uh, one more question, which is that um, you guys have great skills. I'm sure you're employable by so many <laughs> places. You could work anywhere that you <laughs> wanted to. Um, but you're working for the government. So uh, what made you choose this? Do you love this? Would you rather do something else? Why, why, do you, why did you choose this career <laughs> path for yourselves? <laughs> Uh, sure, I guess I can go first. Um, so I've been in the federal government for about a year and a half now, um, and it's been super interesting for me. Uh, it's This was my first federal job, and um, yeah, it's just been, it's been really interesting being inside the government and seeing how the government works from the inside. Because, I mean, I would be honest, I, I even learned more about the census recently than I even knew as like a regular citizen. So I think that I'm just learning a lot more about how the government functions. And I, I love that. Like, I love learning all these things. And I've, I've also found that um, just like, in some, like when the, all the work that we do at, f at the government, in the government, is for the American people. So it's also kind of this this feeling that all the work that we're doing is is in the end helping people do what they need to do. And I just think that's like that's that will make that is what makes me love working in the federal government because I'm I'm creating impact and I'm I'm helping people. Mm -hmm. um, so and also another like brief thing about like innovating in the government. I think like people might laugh at that because like people are like, oh, the government isn't innovative. <laughs> but um, I think unique to our team and, and the sp the space that we're part of, we are innovating in government. We're kind of breaking down those barriers, those silos within teams, and it's as challenging as it is to do that. Once we actually break down a silo, it's it's great to be like, yes, we did that, and like. Things are working better now, and people are getting work done. People are getting the help that they need. So it's it's a really awesome feeling working towards that, and then seeing um, seeing what we're able to do. Yeah, um, I agree with all of that <laughs> for sure. Um, I've I've had the opportunity to work at this is my third federal agency in addition to the Domestic Policy Council at the White House a couple years ago, um, and I for me I think it's just a really great um, opportunity to serve and um, 
you know, like Radhika said, to serve members of the public. Um, it's something that at the federal agencies, we, I find that people believe really strongly is that um, we are there to serve the people of the United States, and that's an incredible privilege. Um, and I think the more that we have technical skills and can, m you know, make efficiency gains and do a better job for each other, um, we should do that. And it's something that over the last few years, a lot of the people who have been our leaders have um, talked about a lot is encouraging, like everyone in this room, to come into government and do a tour of duty um, and, and lend your skills um, to, you know, creating a better government and better country and world for all of us. Um, so, yeah, I hope you do that. It's really, you know, obviously, um, you know, if you've worked at large companies, it's the same level of large bureaucracy. <laughs> um, but, you know, you're doing it all with the goal of, um, you know, creating a better country um, for all of us. So, Awesome. Uh, questions from the audience? Does anybody have a question? Here we go, right here. So I, I hinted at it before. Um, what is your relationship to other government agencies that work in the digital realm, like 18F, mm -hmm. the U.S. Digital Service, and mm -hmm. also, to some extent, Code for America, which works mostly at the city level, mm -hmm. but is attempting to do the same thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we were sort of, the Opportunity Project was sort of incubated out of the same general mothership of all of those things, USDS and um, we worked with a lot of presidential innovation fellows. They were co-founding members of our team and have been really incredible to keeping this process going. Um, so we work closely with the PIFs, um, a co-sort of founding entity of the Opportunity Project was the Office of Science and Technology Policy back in 2015. So they're all sort of like the core family of, of the Opportunity Project. Um, Code for America has also been a really incredible partner. Uh, we had an Opportunity Project challenge at the National Day of Civic Hacking last year when we had uh, brigades across the country. Um, this is a lot of CFA jargon um, for people who might not be familiar, but basically cities and groups across the country um, hosted hackathons. Um, some of them you know, even did longer six-week sort of hackathons around the Opportunity Project cr addressing local issues. So we've tried to stay really close to civic tech, and I think Radhika mentioned we have this toolkit that we are um, trying to propagate and get people to pilot and, and share feedback on, um, and I think civic tech is a great way to do that. Great. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the audience? Yep. Yeah, One. this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. You <laughs> talked briefly about post-hackathon code that was abandoned. How about for your formal projects? Do you evaluate them in terms of adoption by the people you're trying to target? Yes. Um, so I'll take a stab at that and then feel free to add. So um, yes, we do. And much like hackathons, there was a learning curve of how we get to a place where every tool that's created is set up for wild success and adoption and sustainability. So um, we've done sort of three waves of, of sprints with anywhere from 12 to 24 tech teams building at the same time. Um, early on, uh, we, you know, didn't necessarily set the clear expectation that we expected everything to be sustainable because we were sort of in a proof of concept phase. But, you know, over the last year, we've come around to a place where um, we are setting the expectation and have put in a lot of infrastructure through partnership with user advocates, um, you know, partnership with local service facilities, and just a greater expectation that what is created through the sprint um, will continue to grow. Um, we ask teams to sort of commit to sustaining them and designing them in a sustainable way, and then we try to bring the end users to the table from the very beginning so that there is a path to adoption. Um, all of the tools that I talked about at the beginning, so Opportunity Score, um, Find Your Town, and Job Seeker are all actually reaching end users and being used by communities now. So for example, Find Your Town I think has like 200 communities who are using it currently, which they frankly see as you know just the beginning and want to see it used everywhere. Um, so you know it's a year in, and we're still young as an initiative, but we are seeing that some of the communities, some of the some are hopefully most of the tools are being adopted, and we want to set that expectation so that for for the future and the sprints that we're doing now, um, every tool you know is is wildly successful, and that we can track the specific impact on people and communities. Mm -hmm. We've also worked in a 
uh, about a week or two in this coming sprint for usability testing as well. So like exactly partnering with the user advocates to actually get the tool in front of people to be tested and then improved. So I think in the future, it would, it would absolutely be interesting to see all the metrics on which tools are adopted and, and how many people are using them. Great, fantastic. Um, so uh, for all of you here at DevNet Create, uh, as well as virtually online, um, as you know, we formed DevNet Create. This is our first time doing it. We're hoping to build the community uh, amongst all of you. And uh, we've had DevNet for three years. And you know, in doing this, we actually viewed DevNet Create as kind of our give back. Um, so to really give back to the developers and really you know, help the app devs and also help solve real problems. Uh, one thing that we are hoping to do, and I hope uh, I'm going to ask all of you about it because it'll be for our community, is if as we go forward as a community, we could center our many of our efforts around the Opportunity Project and helping to solve problems like this. Is this something that would be interesting to all of you? Yeah? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, um, you know, tonight in our closing session, we can figure out how we can actually work together as a community to solve problems like this uh, using the technologies that we ha all of you have, the industries that you're from, you know, just as even as your individuals or students and developers, how we can all contribute. We're going to have to figure out how to do this together. Um, but I think that we have a big opportunity with the <laughs> Opportunity Project. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot that we can do with all of you with the new DevNet Create community. Thank you very much, Drew and Thank Radhika. You. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. <laughs>